Welcome everyone to this uh, session of uh, politics in the pub. Question time. Colsim Gas. It seems to me that you're using the cane toad method of um, understanding Colsim <laughs> Gas. We really don't know enough about the effects of it. So to use that as a transition, I'm really surprised if that's coming from someone like you who really does understand a lot of the um, issues of um, climate change. So I'm just wondering if you could go, tell us a bit more about why you think the transition when we really just don't know enough about its effects. Well, we do know a lot of its negative effects anyway, but if you could just tell us a bit more about it. Well, I am not an environmental scientist, so I hope that I've peppered my remarks sufficiently with saying, provided the environmentals you know, are, are proper, appropriate, transparent, tested, there's the right baselines, and all the, all the other things that are necessary to be done, you know, that people like chief scientists and others who work and do research in the field, um, if that can be satisfactorily um, you know, accommodated and understood, and those people who are professionally qualified to do so, that is the terms upon which I'm saying we need to be open to using it. And I also, you know, emphasise a couple of other notes that I made. This is coming from coal-fired power generation. Are you completely confident you know, about the environmentals of our current energy sources? You know, I, I, that is one thing I am a bit better qualified to make an observation about. This involves stripping, you know, tens and tens of metres of overburden to reveal, to expose a coal seam, having impact on uh, water courses, the terrain, the environment, the flora, the fauna, you know, many. It, it is not a process, open cut coal mining or underground coal mining, that is sort of some kind of environmental um, you know, best state for us to have. Um, but we use it and we're, we're burning it and we're producing massive amounts of greenhouse gas as a consequence. We are the highest emitter of greenhouse gases per capita amongst the advanced economies because of our dependence upon the burning of coal for our electricity source. And what I'm trying to do, if the environmentals can be satisfied, to, you know, to, a, to a standard that the community might have a consensus about, then I think it should be used as a transition fuel to get us to a cleaner energy position in the future. That's what I'm saying. And um, there is a, a capacity now, good or bad, uh, to have a look at the experience in Queensland and to do extensive research about the exploitation of coal seam gas in the uh, fields in Queensland for us to have a much better understanding about the impact of this and if it can't be effectively satisfied the, the a proper set of environmental tests by appropriately qualified people in a transparent way if that can't be satisfied then we shouldn't use it I agree but it's a very complex picture for us to get to a, a complete renewable energy position overnight um, given given some of the realities that we confront and this is where institutions of power are an extremely important part of the equation. Um, you know, those powerful forces in our society uh, just don't step out of the way and we magically produce a 100% uh, renewable energy tomorrow. You know, it requires you to be pragmatic, tough, engage in the political process, you know, make the personal sacrifices, to go into Parliament and affect the public policy process. Um, it's, it's a tough course of action to take. And what I'm saying to you is that on the basis of my experience of many years of doing things like that, what I've described to you, if the environmentals can be satisfied, I think it to be the best path for us to get our greenhouse gas emissions down quite dramatically and to support clean energy technology so that we get off fossil fuels altogether sometime in the future. That, that's my, essentially the argument I'm making. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, I think Labor had a very good policy when they had the uh, solar panel rebate because it encouraged people to take up alternative energy. Now, I don't understand why Labor cancelled that in favour of a carbon tax, which I think is a negative tax because it actually 
puts a price of electricity up, and a lot of companies have said that they would go overseas because uh, the cost of electricity is too high here. But why don't you keep with the solar panel policy and similar ones to encourage people to take up alternative energy? We put in place a renewable energy target so that 20% of electricity would come from renewable energy by 2020. Um, and above that, set a uh, subsidy scheme for the installation of solar panels that worked in conjunction with state government schemes in feed-in tariffs and the like. Um, as Minister, I reduced the extent of the subsidy for the solar panels, but we didn't terminate it. And the, re the reason I did that was a num for, uh, there were a number of reasons for it. One is that it was a purely demand-driven uh, program and it was successful, which was a great thing, but that has huge implications for Commonwealth um, budgetary expenditures. When you have uncapped demand-driven programs that take off, uh, you can end up in serious budgetary difficulty. So that was one element. Um, another element was we were introducing carbon pricing, and that is a more cost-effective way to the economy and to Australian households of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as I said earlier, it applied to about 350 of uh, the biggest polluters in the economy. What it did is say to them, for every tonne of greenhouse gas they produce, they have to buy a permit. Here's your permit, pay us $23 for it, for every tonne. That provides them a very powerful incentive to reduce their emissions. It also levels the playing field in the electricity market for the cost of renewable energy to come in and to increase and increases, you know, by relative, in relative terms, the cost of fossil fuel generated energy, and particularly the highest polluting energy sources had to buy more permits, therefore that became a more expensive source of electricity. So the whole electricity market adjusts, and that's what you've got to try and do, tackle at the macro scale where the big greenhouse gas emissions take place uh, to try and reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the economy. And, uh, on top of that, we're also very conscious that uh, the price of solar panels was coming down quite significantly. Um, you know, they're, they're basically all produced in China. We had a strong dollar. The cost of production mass through mass techniques in China was bringing the cost down quite a lot. And they were becoming far more affordable for people. That's why we tapered off the subsidies as well. And so we had still had a scheme in place. There were state feed-in tariff arrangements for solar panels on roofs. There was a renewable energy target to be satisfied with billions of investment, and there was a carbon pricing scheme. And people often misunderstand the carbon pricing scheme. The, the purpose was to make the big polluters buy the permits for their pollution <coughs> and provide them the incentive to reduce their emissions, become more efficient, and to adjust the market so that cheaper and cleaner forms of, of energy were more competitive in the marketplace. And all that worked. And you've got to tackle it at that level. It wasn't, you know, as people misinterpreted, a, a sort of incentive for consumers at a household level um, to reduce their emissions. It was a macroeconomic tool to get the big polluters to reduce their emissions. When John Howard was in power, there was a revolving door between the bureaucracy and the fossil fuel companies. Uh, this was exposed by Guy Pearce, who was an advisor to um, Peter Costello. And he did his PhD, he got all of this on, on tape, he wrote a book, and there was at least one Four Corners program on it. Does it, you know, the fossil fuel company people were coming in, writing policy, and the bureaucrats were going from the bureaucracy to the fossil fuel company. Did you experience that in your time in Parliament? Does that still happen? Absolutely. <laughs> the, uh, I, I hope I might have made it um, evident in my remarks, or the remarks I made about carbon pricing, the power of the uh, fossil fuel companies, and particularly the coal mining companies. Um, they're immensely powerful players in our economy. Are they actually and, writing policy, though? Oh, That's they would be proffering policy papers without any doubt whatsoever. They you know, while offering, I don't know if you noticed, but one of the things that came out in ICAC, even though it was a Brickworks um, yeah. company, you know, providing questions for Tony Abbott to ask in question time over carbon pricing, the fossil fuel companies were doing all that sort of thing for the Liberals. Um, 
hosting Tony Abbott at, at uh, mining sites and providing him data you know, to, with suspect uh, basis to it. Large businesses were, uh, <coughs> excuse me, resourcing uh, the Liberal Party with all sorts of political opportunities to attack carbon pricing and to attack labour and you bet that would be going on and they'd be cheering about uh, the repeal of carbon pricing and the so-called direct action policy which of course is just a load of rubbish and nonsense um, that won't do anything other than waste taxpayers money on grants to businesses to do what they were already going to do anyway and just to follow business as usual emissions reductions. And what's happened is a complete joke and of course it's it's at the behest of, of very powerful interests. That's right. It's win, and I'll, I'll ask a different question from a different angle. Now, it's to do with values, Greg. And you, you really represent that, and that's why we're all here tonight. But a lot of us are very, very concerned that Labor is not distinguishing itself from the terrible policies of the Liberal, the number one issue, the number one issue which is to do with basic human rights is the barbarity of the Australian refugee policy. Yes. So the first thing is, and we've had many, many of a night here with leading expert people and what we keep on saying, there's a bipartisanship between Labor and the Liberal government on that issue, which is one of the most barbaric issues in the, of any Western country. That's number one. Number two, there's a new crisis emerging with Abbott going to a khaki war and these new laws that are being proposed, which will uh, basically shut down public debate because the journalists will be actually a threat, under threat. We don't hear a word from the opposition, the Labor opposition, on that issue, which is a human rights issue. And the next thing that's coming up is the destruction of the ABC. And I just hope that so far there's been not a word that I've read of a comment from the leader of the, of the Labor Party or senior ministers condemning what is obvious, which is going to be major cuts. So could you address yourself to these more value-laden, moral questions? And, and, how, and, and do you see there is a real problem for the soul of the Labor Party? Talk about the soul of the Labor Party in, with those sort of three examples that I've given you. But of course, starting with the refugee issue. Well, thank you so much for that, Wynne. <laughs> <laughs> This, this is the hardest, <coughs> I always found this the hardest, <laughs> for the obvious reasons. You know, I believe in, in the importance of people being treated decently and respected, and particularly if you're seeking refuge from persecution in your own country, um, it's extremely important that you're able to find refuge. Um, but it's bloody hell. It, it's such a diabolically complex and difficult political issue in this country, and that's essentially what we're talking about politics. You know, I'm very confident that my colleagues, I'm not obviously not speaking for Labor uh, anymore, but I'm very confident about my colleagues, former colleagues in Canberra, that they do have values that respect people and care for people. There's no doubt about that. And I've got to even go so far as to say that some on the other side of politics, of course, um, share those values. But you are confronted <coughs> with some brutal realities in our democracy is the truth of it. And there's a sort of underlying question uh, in this area of, in, in refugee policy um, that you can't escape and in respect of which that it's a very potent political issue that political parties can't afford to ignore. And that is, well, how many refugees should we take in to Australia? Should it be unlimited? Should anyone who's genuinely a, you know, a refugee arriving in Australia uh, be allowed to stay. And the UN Human Rights Convention and Refugees Conventions imply that. However, um, Australia has a capped humanitarian intake, refugee intake. And um, you know, that's at the source of the policy dilemma with this. 
will the Australian community accept that being uncapped and accept that, uh, you know, that, that people smuggling rings, you know, for the vernacular that's used, um, have the right to decide who we take in all of that too. That through the payment of monies we'll take, you know, particular people who are able to um, come by that method, whereas others who sit in Malaysia for 20 years in a refugee camp, they're just going to stay there. Those are really potent issues in this debate that go to how many people we take in and on what grounds. And I can assure you that it was for, not only for me, but for everyone else around the cabinet table in government, this was a gut-wrenching, terribly hard issue for us to grapple with. And I don't think anyone would truly be comfortable uh, with where it has sat. Um, so I don't have the solution to this, but once again, it's, it represents some of the, like, the clash between values and hard political kind of realities in our democracy. Ultimately, that has to be changed and won by political leadership arguing <coughs> for the values to be respected. That is what the core of it is. And, you know, I, th I think there will be political leadership that comes forward ultimately and says to people, right, let's get it right down to basics here. Do you care about the person next to you? Do you care about someone in Indonesia? Do you care about people in Africa? Do you care about them in Afghanistan? Are you a human being with compassion for others and respect? And if you are, then you know, that has policy implications and you argue it that way. It's argued in an entirely different paradigm in our politics and whilst ever it's argued there, the policy outcomes are going to stay there. Um, so it's a really hard issue. I found it incredibly difficult, but ultimately you're right on the, you know, hit the nail on the head with, with suggesting it's in relation to values. So I hope that gives you a bit of a, an idea. And the ABC? The, the, the war and the ABC. The Hands the off! War. Middle East war. The mid oh, uh, and press right. freedom. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Come on. Do the ABC. That's the ABC. ABC, okay. Well, I'm conflicted. Um, Winita Phillips is my partner. Yeah. <laughs> I love the ABC. <laughs> I, love, I love the 7 o'clock news presenter. What about late lines? <laughs> they better bloody well keep their hands, their hands off her. <laughs> yeah, I look, this is just all ideology and crap, you know, from the government. It's a disgusting disgrace. It's got everyone at the ABC terrified about their future, feeling insecure. And, you know, the management of the ABC and the board... Pretty weak. I think they need to take a pretty firm position, just be my personal view. <laughs> not speaking for Juanita or anyone else at the ABC. Um, there's no... Uh, there's that? no point kind of going along with the Abbott government and saying, oh, how much would you like us to cut and then in the government? So, we come to us with a number. Mm -hmm. you know, tell us what you're going to do. And, and as soon as you proffer a number, they're going to say double or treble. You know, Basically, you've got a responsibility, I reckon, if you're running those, an organisation like the ABC to sort of say, OK, you know, let's sort the, the crap from what's real. The ABC is an extremely important institution. We're running it, we're leading it. Um, you know, we think our budget is efficiently deployed and that's what we need to deliver these services and, and argue it out with Malcolm Turnbull and the others in government and let the government make a call about it. And if, the community doesn't like the call the government makes, well, let them know. You know? And on the, uh, I assume you mean the current deployment or the, the, yeah. to, to... And the new laws your, uh, that are proposed. Oh, yeah, the new laws that are mm -hmm. attached to it, yeah. Basic breach of basic human rights with threats even to the Well, uh, I'd, be the worried if, I'd be worried if I was a journalist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in those circumstances, you know. But that's not my point. Yeah. And that's the point I, it's where is the Labor stand on these issues? Well, if, if, if you'll forgive me. Not just, just your personal view. I mean, where do you feel that there is a problem that on the issue, even on the refugee, yeah. it was Labor that did the worst aspect of the refugee, and that was the offshore detention? That is where, that's where the absolute horror is. That was started by Keating, followed by Rudd, followed by Gillard. 
that's where the real lack of morality is over this very complex issue. On the question of the law, of the law, we're concerned about the law. Yeah. Okay. And not just your opinion, but well, are you concerned about the lack of there being from the Labor opposition Correct. a voice, and that's in opposition to the government Correct. on these great issues. Yeah. Well. <laughs> You're going to um, not like my response because I'm not going to publicly crap on the Labor Party or the people who are currently in it. And I might have different personal views, but I'm not going to be, and I didn't in my book either. You know, I'm not a kiss and tell person, and I'm not going to crap on people that I worked with. Yeah, if I answer the question, it's going to be interpreted a particular way, right? And, and I'm not going to do it. What I say in this sort of thing is going to be reported, and that's the way democracy works. The next thing, they'll be fielding criticisms from Greg Convey, and I'm not going to do it. Shall I turn the camera off? <laughs> off the record? You just imagine the YouTube. Clear the Telegraph journalist. <laughs> well, that says something in okay. No, I think we've got time for about three more questions. Yeah. Greg. Oh, no. the, the, the spotlight now is on the IS issue. Um, Abbott is running around the world beating his chest and, you know, taking a lead on, on it. It seems that your Labour Party is just following him. Nothing much has been said. And the recent um, anti-Muslim sort of, of, of campaign, you know, the anti burqa thing, Labour Party has said nothing except for perhaps Melissa Parks. I mean, where, where is that, that courage? I mean, the, the whole budget, the in, you know, Australian policy has been eclipsed by him running around the whole world, you know, on the world stage beating his chest and, you know, uh, uh, joining the coalition of the willing. <laughs> Labour Party has said nothing whatsoever and just said everything, yeah, all right, go ahead, you know, the, the, the RCO laws, the everything, you know, has just let him through. Yes. Well, I'm not here representing the Labour Party, right? So I'm not here, I haven't been party to the decisions they've made, the announcements they've made over the last 12 or 15 months, and I'm not here to represent them, right? And nor am I going to crap on them for the reasons I described a little while ago. Greg, I found the most moving part of your presentation tonight, the stories of the major successes of campaigns and resistance, if you like, um, and it was also motivating, if I may say so. Um, having just returned to Australia quite recently, my observation at the moment is that uh, the political imperative for the left is urgent. We have an extraordinarily right-wing government which is, in a sense, almost shaming Australia as a laughing stock for, uh, for John Selwyn Gummer to call this government the most ignorant in the world in relation to climate. It's just one of a number of international criticisms, it seems to me. And also I feel a lot of frustration um, at people on the broad left in Australia at the situation. My observation is that the trade union movement is much diminished in capacity and leadership uh, than it was in the times that you've been talking about. The period of divine leadership, you're referring to. Yes. <laughs> yes, bless them all. But um, also, of course, I think my observation is the broad left as a whole um, is quite fragmented and lacking clear leadership. And I just wonder, to finish off the evening <laughs> on an easy question, whether you would like to give us your observations about what steps could be taken now to actually regather the forces to resist uh, the inevitable um, uh, threats that we face. Well, thank you. You might remember that at various times in our history, there's been tremendous fragmentation on the progressive side of politics in this country. Like it's, whatever we've got now is nothing by comparison uh, to the, the difficulties of the 50s and we, when you had a, a pretty well-organised Communist Party and, the, and Labor and then the DLP splitting off. You know, there were periods of profound division that helped keep the Conservatives in government for a long time. We don't have that now. I think what you're really averting to is that there's not a, a, a tangible or a really evident mass left organisational capability in our democracy at the moment. And, 
of course, many things have changed that have brought that about, not the least of which is technology and you know, where different sorts of power for organisation have come from through social media and the like. And I think that's just the lessons we have to learn how to use in today's society um, with different technologies, what, different ways of organising people. Um, you know, the major source of funding for the Labor Party now is, is well, I think it's called crowdfunding, isn't it? You know, yeah, small donations from a very large populace of people, hardly any of whom are members of the Labor Party, but they're supporters of, of progressive policy positions. Um, they probably donate to a number of causes and different political organisations, including Labor. Um, but that's now the major thing. Now, that takes vested interests. Um, then diminishes and mitigates the influence they have within Labor and other political parties, um, provides a mass funding source and a base for, for really great campaigning. And one of the things we did in the Rights at Work campaign, for example, is to use that concept. We did crowdfunding to pay for a lot of the things that we did, small $10, 20 $50 donations from hundreds of thousands of people over the internet, and we disseminated campaign material alerted people that John Howard was appearing at the Sofitel Hotel or something at five o'clock and got thousands of people there on half an hour's notice. You know, you could do lots of different things and um, the, the central elements to what you've got to do is, is articulate values, policy propositions that emanate from your values, um, use modern campaigning techniques and ensure that people know what you're fighting for and go after it. And, with that, I think the progressively minded people across our society can still be immensely uh, influential, and particularly now. There's too much despondency around, you know, it's all too hard, and terrible, how the war for was it said before, you know. Um, that's all rubbish, you know. There is no greater opportunity than for progressive people to run now. Well, Abbott's given. <laughs> Just, it's a, like a picker box thing of, of stuff to campaign on. And, and we've got a campaign on it. You know? So um, don't be down because you don't think the Labor Party's doing enough or something else. There are lots of ways to engage in political activism now and engage in it and coalesce with people and choose the things that you think are important and go after them because I think what we'll see emerge over the next uh, 12 to 18 months in particular and the lead up to the next federal election is is a more coherent uh, you know, political opposition to the government that won't simply be articulated by Labor in Canberra it'll be articulated by the community you can just sense it there's a sort of seething resentment mm -hmm. about the things that are happening and the lies that have been told and the crass nature of the opportunist politics as it's played out and the influence of vested interests in a lot of the decisions. And we've obviously got lots of different views here. Many people would differ with what I've said this evening, no doubt, but we've got a, a, a binding set of values, I reckon, um, that if we if we are true to that, then we can bring about change in the country. I'm really confident of it. And you know, throughout my working life, I'm sorry to promote the book again, but that's what that book's about basically what you've got to do to try and bring about change. And the fundamental of it is values and organisation. Greg, uh, I think I'm going to give you a credit for, <laughs> for pessimism of the intellect. Credit for pessimism of the intellect, but a high distinction for optimism of the will. Yeah.